species. Brian finished his PhD at UBC, but he's originally from Nova Scotia, and he loves to explore biodiversity across Canada and, in fact, around the world. And Brian is obviously very effective at uh, not only studying biodiversity, but conveying his research interests, as he recently won a Teaching Excellence Award at the University of Victoria. Uh, and one of the neat things about Brian is he doesn't have an organismal bias to his research and he's comfortable working across the taxonomic spectrum from plants to insects to birds. And that is likely why he has been such a, a wonderful proponent for the iNaturalist program, the topic of the talk tonight. Um, and I told those of you who are at the AGM tonight uh, about Kate, when I nominated her to become one of the directors of the board, uh, uh, on the board of the Friends of Ecological Reserves. So you know by now that she's one of our newest directors. Uh, what you likely don't know is that her passion for biology was kindled when she received her first digital camera at age 10 and began taking pictures outdoors. And so Kate grew up exploring the forested areas of Vancouver Island, often with a camera in hand. And her passion for ecology led her to pursue a bachelor's degree in forest biology at the University of Victoria. And after completing that degree uh, in the spring of 2020, she worked as a field assistant for the BC Parks iNaturalist project. And then last fall, Kate became the project's coordinator and she's been busy preparing for the upcoming field season. So Brian originally agreed to present at the uh, Friends AGM last spring, only to have it postponed due to the pandemic. And then last fall, he confirmed that he and Kate would be giving the talk, uh, but then because of the provincial uh, election and more COVID restrictions, the talk um, was postponed again and then moved on to Zoom. So um, nature has been a great refuge for many of us during the pandemic. And um, we look forward to hearing about your biodiversity inventory field work in protected areas across BC, especially the ecological reserves and the plans for the future studies. And we thank you so much for being patient as things got postponed and changed. So welcome to Brian and Kate. Hey, thank you very much, Jenny, for that really nice introduction. That's uh, it's really nice. I, I don't get to say um, my full Ian McTaggart Gowan professorship title very often. It always shocks me how long it has been. Such a an <laughs> honor to uh, uh, you know to, to um, try and carry on some of what uh, Dr. McTaggart Cowan was able to do here in BC. I'm going to uh, um, share my screen here. Maybe while I do that, Kate, you could uh, introduce yourself so everybody can see you too. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, I feel like Jenny's kind of said it all at this point, um, but thank you all for coming. I'm really looking forward to sharing all of this work that Brian and John and the iNaturalist team has done and that I've been able to be a part of for the last year or so. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, so folks, I, it might look like I'm um, staring off into space, but what I got here is a very sophisticated three monitor setup that uh, I have in my office. I came up to my office tonight because it's Friday night pizza night at Shea Starzomsky Peltier uh, and uh, I didn't want to bother my son and my wife as they um, eat pizza and watch the movie. So it's a real pleasure though to, to be able to talk today about the BC Parks I Naturalist project, this uh, project that we've been working on. Now this will be the third year of it uh, and I'm going to try and do my best to uh, give you a flavor for what it is that we do, where we've covered, why we do it, uh, who we've worked with, which is a huge um, number of people, including, um, I hope that everybody can see my screen. Maybe Kate, you could give me a thumbs up if it looks right on your end, or Jenny, great. Yeah, thanks. And, and what I would say is that the reason I've got three um, screens set up here is so that I can see folks, I can see the chat, uh, and uh, I can see my presentation. So if you have any questions, if you need any clarification, if I skip over something or I'm not doing a, a good job, put a, uh, put a message into the chat and I'll do my best to answer it as I go along. Don't be shy about doing that. 
So I'm going to talk about the BC Parks I Naturalist Project, uh, um, work that I'm doing uh, with John Reynolds at SFU as the co-lead uh, with Kate uh, here uh, mentioned in bold, we've already met, who's our uh, project manager at the moment, and a whole host of other people, some of whom I've uh, uh, mentioned here, like Lena, Jason, Thomas, Celeste, and Bridget, all of whom worked a, a bit on the team last year. And I'll start by saying I'm going to take a very broad uh, journey across the BC Park system, which is enormous. It takes up a, a really big chunk, around 15% of the land base of BC. It's 1,033 separate properties uh, or protected areas. It's a big project. Uh, and uh, the ecological reserves are a big part of that. I'm very interested myself in doing some uh, research, especially on um, some of the species at risk in Trial Islands Ecological Reserve and Great Chain Islets Ecological Reserve, uh, which, um, as we talked about earlier in the, the meeting, could use an awful lot of um, ecological restoration work, especially on removing invasives. Let's see here. So probably a number of you know a little bit about or even contribute to uh, various citizen science and, and uh, community science projects that are uh, ongoing uh, across uh, Canada, around the world. This was a, uh, an article that was published in the eBird uh, Review uh, just this past week that, uh, that somebody had posted on, on Facebook. And it shows this really dramatic growth in the use of uh, citizen science platforms like eBird or community science platforms like eBird. You can see uh, a long um, tail here of uh, of it uh, sort of beetling away. And then as computer use and, and things like iPhone use or phone cell phone use, everybody's got one in their pocket now. It's just an exponential increase in the number of observations, in, in this case, the number of checklists submitted in Canada to eBird in 2020. So over a million last year. And this, this is really remarkable to me as a, as a biologist, somebody who, as Jenny pointed out, I work across the taxonomic spectrum. I'm not an expert on very many of those taxa because there are something like 9 million species in the world, right? There might be 70,000 species in British Columbia. And so this is something that I find very, very useful. How do we use all of that? Uh, or how do we um, engage with people who are very, very keen about nature and want to contribute to our understanding of biodiversity? So here, this is a photo um, from the 2019 Yukon BioBlitz that uh, I went to John Reynolds and I drove up with my nine-year-old son, Zach, uh, who just in the last uh, few years, I've tried to take into the field with me as much as possible. He's been to some really wonderful parts of BC, including many ecological reserves. He's got massive energy for hanging out with people. He's learning to really love biodiversity. And and uh, he gets so excited about these things that he finds. So as an example here, he's with uh, Cameron Eckert, one of Canada's great dragonfly experts and really great guy with kids, uh, it turns out. Um, and Zach somehow had a net, a bug net put into his hand. I think it was Sid Cannings who, uh, who passed it to him. Uh, and he just went crazy. I turned my back to talk to somebody and he was going off looking for dragonflies. And here he is, he's pointing some out to, to Cam Eckert, Eckert who told him about this uh, rare species that we might get lucky enough to find called the uh, boreal snaketail. So we looked and looked and looked for this boreal snaketail around Watson Lake uh, and uh, went to a specific spot, in fact, along the Liard River where we knew there was some warm water. Sid Cannings had an idea that it was there. Here are Sid's fingers. Uh, we, we got skunked, we, we couldn't find it, but Zach was so excited about this. He really, really wanted to uh, see this boreal snake tail. He was looking everywhere. He was getting a little bit cranky because we were um, walking through this very buggy forest. And at this point, I was actually carrying him on my back through a, a little creek uh, to, uh, to get him across the water. And bang, there was the boreal snake tail uh, right there. He saw it. Uh, I ran across the river with him, dropped him off, netted it with one of the nets and took it over. And, um, and Sid uh, pulled it out of the net. And you can see he's holding it here, Zach was desperate to take a photo and record this and share his biodiversity observation. There's been you know, very, very few opportunities to do this. He has more museum specimens deposited than I do because Sid uh, worked with him so much, especially on bees at this BioBlitz. But here he is in his iNaturalist account, Baron Owl Hoot, and he's contributed to uh, um, our understanding of biodiversity, which is really neat. 
uh, kids have all of this uh, um, energy and, and uh, um, all of this excitement. And there's a bit of a kid in all of us, right? This is the biggest kid that I know, uh, John Reynolds, who's a professor at Simon Fraser University. We've been working together as scientific colleagues for a long while. Uh, working on various community ecological and population ecology um, studies of nutrients transfers across uh, landscape boundaries and so on. But we're both naturalists at heart. This is what got us into, uh, into science in the first place. But typically we're very focused on just the things that we need to do to do our work. And we have very few opportunities to contribute to um, better understanding biodiversity patterns, even though we love that. We're constantly recording these things. Uh, John um, has historically put a lot of eBird uh, records into eBird. But there, uh, until recently, there really wasn't an easy way for us to contribute um, our observations, despite the fact that as biologists, we're out there and we see these cool things all the time. It's really wonderful. So in the last few years, since about 2018, iNaturalist has really taken off. It is that long tail like eBird. It's probably uh, in terms of uptake around like 2014 or so um, where eBird was. But what really um, is interesting about it, it's this free downloadable app that you can have on your cell phone. Everybody's got a cell phone now, everybody can use it. You don't need to necessarily have the fancy pair of cameras like uh, Kate's wearing around her neck here, uh, but you can have them and you can take really great photos like Kate does. Um, or you, you can just use your phone. It has this wonderful artificial intelligence based identification uh, by scanning photos and it will suggest uh, a species ID to you, which is really great for, uh, um, for helping uh, beginners and so on. And frankly, it helps uh, many of us who sort of know what we're looking at, but we may not always know exactly what it is. It's a two-step process though. It requires a human to actually go in and, and look at it and confirm it to make it um, research grade. But this is great because people are traveling around the world. We can get new species locations. We can find new locations for um, species that we thought that we knew lots about. We can find more observations, especially for a lot of biodiversity that we just have never had a good way to, uh, to survey. A lot of insects, spiders, and so on will come up later. We can track change the sort of things that ecological reserves are so great. We can go in and we can survey year after year. We can upload our photos from the past. And it's a really uh, engaging way to uh, work with people and get them out in BC parks. So it's this wonderful tool that makes this massive data set that can monitor biodiversity in space and time at a frequency and over an extent that we've never really been able to do before. Um, despite being able to do all kinds of great surveys in, in the past and even, um, and, and of course, continuing now. But this just extends it and gets more people looking. And the observations are remarkable. Um, I, I didn't try very hard to put together this slide. I could make a thousand slides like this of really wonderful observations from British Columbia. Uh, these are ones that people have either contacted me about uh, recently or are ones that I've noticed because they're people who I really admire who um, our outlots, uh, like Mary San Severino here, um, who found the rare common blue cup on one of her many excursions. This one from Gary from the, uh, um, from the Fraser River, uh, the ecological reserve that we were talking about before. This, uh, I find this an amazing um, little liverwort that manages to persist on these rapidly um, moving uh, um, landscapes, right? They're constantly changing the sediment and so on. A couple of kayakers uh, apparently found uh, a dead green sea turtle. This is the first INAT record for Canada out near Machosan uh, just last week, I think it was. This showed up on iNaturalist. You can see these sorts of things. There's really great discussion sometimes on there. For, um, for example, this is Thomas Barbin from our team uh, who found this, uh, um, this millipede that's infected with an aridivirus that you know, we sometimes see in things like uh, um, uh, pill bugs, uh, but it was found uh, in, in, in this millipede instead. There's some neat discussion about what kind of a root of virus it might be. Really wonderful um, botanists like Vanessa Robinson, who, who finds rare species. Someone contacted me about they were doing their own surveys of uh, um, snake uh, and reptile in general use of roads in the Okanagan. So these wonderful observations of nighttime observations of, for example, rattlesnakes 
using roads that are pretty heavily used. Um, and so this, this went right on to the, the BC Parks folks who had the ability to, uh, to do something, maybe about changing traffic patterns and so on. It can also be really great uh, um, photos like Thomas Barbin, who's a really wonderful macro photographer of the Sabernata Sansoni. They get really weird ones. Uh, he'll always get weird ones from John, like this hooded merganser that he found on a road. You know, these are observations we just, like, they would never really be recorded by at, at this frequency by, by other folks. One thing I do want to point out, uh, if you're wondering about this, uh, in, in the cases of really rare species like this snake, they're put into a, uh, um, a random location. So this little dot is not actually where it was seen. It's put in a, about a 35 square kilometer box so that people can't go and, for example, um, you know, trap rattlesnakes or, or find uh, endangered species or threatened species like Western screech owl. So I'm going to talk about the ways that we've pulled these sorts of things together in, um, in a project on iNaturalist. I'll talk a little bit about what projects are in a bit. Um, but in particular, in this, in this wonderful partnership with, uh, with the folks in BC Parks called the BC Parks iNaturalist Project. This is something that, uh, that John Reynolds and I uh, talked about for years, trying to figure out ways to um, increase our ability to um, you know, document some of the things that we were seeing out on the landscape when we were doing our research, whether it's on the, the central coast or on the top of a mountain in the Lillooet drainage or something. So we wanted to develop um, a project that had a really defined and focused extent that would contribute to better understanding BC's most beautiful landscapes, which certainly covers, you know, BC parks and ecological reserves. Because it turns out that you know, BC Parks has very, very few um, species lists for many of the landscapes, many of the parks or protected areas that they, um, that they manage. Uh, I didn't even know that there was a thing called a Great Grig until a couple of years ago when I started using iNaturalist. I certainly didn't know that they glowed under UV light, as Thomas showed here. You know, you can find all these interesting things. We thought it would be a really engaging place to start because everybody loves BC Parks. And we could, uh, through crowdsourcing these uh, community or citizen science observations, we get more data on what's out there in nature. And we were already working in several protected areas. I don't know how I got to be so lucky that uh, I get to go and work in places like the Hakai um, protected area on the central coast and to be doing plant or seaweed surveys and look up. I've had this happen at least half a dozen times, maybe 10 times now, look up and have a wolf um, looking at me. Never before could I do something with those observations, but now, um, you know, through iNaturalist, this is something that I can um, um, share as biodiversity data. So working within those protected areas, we could contribute even more than the science that we were doing. And of course, partnerships soon developed with uh, um, organizations like the BC Parks Foundation, the Hackeye Institute, the Pacific Wildlife Foundation, the Sitka Foundation as funders and, and partners. And I just put this uh, observation of Thomas up here. I don't know if uh, James Miskelly or Jimmy Legs is on the, the call. James, maybe this is when you've seen uh, a possible range extension of, uh, or um, you know, a very out of range individual of this uh, um, sage tree cricket found in, in a park by Thomas Barbin this past summer. So when we um, thought about this, what, what we do with iNaturalist is that it's this, um, it's this group that is run, it, it developed as a, um, a master's project at the University of California, Berkeley, and has uh, really expanded since then, especially with the addition of the artificial intelligence to help with uh, species IDs. It's a big database where you can upload your observations and you can look at them online. You can also go in and you can create projects uh, online. So there are two different types of projects that I'll talk about. Uh, this is the so-called umbrella project, the BC Parks one that pulls together all of the collection projects from each individual protected area. So Hack Ilex Belize Conservancy and Goldstream Provincial Park are, were the, the leaders at the beginning of this in May 2019 before our first field season. And what we did is we had 1,033 different uh, boundaries that we needed to upload to iNaturalist and then create these projects, put banner photos and descriptions and so on. So our initial idea was that we would hire our um, our summer uh, field uh, naturalists to work on this, but for the first two months, they'd be putting together these projects. Turned out actually that uh, um, with 
John and I, with the help of one of my graduate students, who's a, who's a really great naturalist, Andrew Simon, uh, came up with a way to develop these projects so that we could make them in about three minutes each. And so we had finished all of the, um, all, all of the individual park collection projects uh, by the end of February. So we could dive right into getting into the field in May. At, at the beginning of May, 2019, we had about 17,715 observations of about 2,700 species, about 1,000 people had contributed to the project. In that first year, we sent a team of four plus several grad students, et cetera, out. Uh, and then, of course, the number of observers doubled. Um, that's what's happening with uh, iNaturalist citizen science data. It's doubling every year. It's growing exponentially. At the end of that first year, we uh, had 113,000 observations of almost 5,000 species. This past year, despite the restrictions of COVID, uh, we didn't get to travel as far. Uh, we've managed to um, get to over 265,000 observations of close to 7,000 species. The number of observers continues to double uh, each year. And I think this is partly because we know that it's healthy to be out in nature and, and people can uh, uh, really want to get out into BC parks. We saw this when parks were closed up to May 14th last year. People were desperate to get into the parks and they were, the government relented and, and let them in. So we have these huge number of um, observers, including our team. And we've grown the project by a quarter million observations in, in less than two years. But really what's interesting is the number of people who are contributing you know, are joining this project because they actually want to get updates about uh, what we're observing, what everyone is observing, and the community. So these are people who are, um, without being paid, without being compensated in any way, are really interested in what people are seeing. They're often experts, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. We have uh, about 4,400 people who are identifying species for us. And this has been really remarkable, the amount of back and forth that we've had about uh, individual observations where we were wrong and they, they pointed out how we were wrong, which helped us to um, improve things or where we were right and it was something exciting. That's the most exciting part of the projects, the fact that uh, this is a really great community of people. You can see this on your phone uh, as well. Uh, to be honest with you, I take um, probably 80% of all of my iNaturalist observations with my phone. It's very easy to do. Everyone has a cell phone in their pocket. Um, but I don't use the app in the field, really. I'm just concentrating on observing nature, taking photos when I want to. I'll go back home and I'll upload them later on on a computer where it's much easier. So I just download them from my phone to my, my photo software and then I export them to iNaturalist. But, but you can see some of the, um, the observations on your phone if you're interested. And in fact, uh, the BC Parks iNaturalist project is one of the featured projects for Canada. So if you're looking for projects nearby to look at um, when you're looking on your, on your cell phone, you'll find the BC Parks project along with Parks Canada, Ontario Parks, and one I'll talk about later, um, the Observation Nation project. Because these uh, um, because these projects are so easy and fun to make, we made one, of course, for the BC Parks Ecological Reserves for this, uh, for this talk and this meeting. You can go there and you can see, I think, every ecological reserve except one or two that we've had boundary issues with are in there. We've got about 10,000 observations of close to 2,000 species there. And this is, uh, this is all freely available. Anyone can go. If you observe something in one of these uh, um, ecological reserves and you upload, uh, from your phone or your computer and it's geotagged, it'll automatically be included in the project. You don't have to do anything special. You can check it out uh, at this link. So this is really great too because it makes this wonderful list of species found in these protected areas. So for Haynes Lease Ecological Reserve, we can go in and see there's been about a thousand observations. Here are the top species. Here's what you're likely to see if you're there, um, especially uh, between uh, May and August. So this is a real boon. It, it serves as a little bit of a guidebook, a uh, field guide to each individual protected area across the province. One thing I should point out is that we tend to think of uh, iNaturalist observations as these observations that are made just for one purpose, just to show that a species was there. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of secondary data included in many of these observations, like these photos, where we can see, for example, 
um, a beach hopper being um, scavenged here by a number of staphylinid beetles. These are the sorts of things where we can get predator prey interactions or we can get trophic interactions like this that are additional data that you can extract from community science. And then, uh, of course, you can check it all out at, uh, at this link, the BC Parks link. One of the big components of this, of course, though, is hiring our, um, our team of surveyors for the summer. This is a dream job, I, I think. I like to do it when I get to go out with them. I think that uh, this is the sort of thing that I uh, would have loved to have done when I was a young naturalist. Uh, and we've advertised for our two teams of three this summer. Uh, we had over 200 applications that we're just about to start the interviews for. But we've had, uh, um, we put together projects to kind of track what uh, people are contributing. This is both in and out of BC parks. But you can see our teams have collected over 180,000 observations uh, while in the field. And Kate's going to tell us a little bit about this here. But she put together this really nice infographic of what um, she was able to do last year. Um, normally, we would have traveled further around BC. We would have started earlier in the year. She didn't start until uh, the middle of May. You can see we're restricted because of COVID uh, travel restrictions, but still quite a lot of uh, work was, was done. Do you want to take it away, Kate? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, like Brian said, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what it's like to be one of these field naturalists, everything that goes into the field season. And um, yeah, just let you in on a little insight uh, as to what that's like. So uh, I have to ask Brian to flip my slides for me since he's screen sharing. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> so as uh, Brian showed on that previous slide, we spent a total of 75 days in the field season. To break this down a little bit, um, we spent 25 days on Vancouver Island and in the lower mainland. 23 days in the Okanagan up north to the Chilcotin region, 14 days in central East BC, and 13 days in the Kootenays. And we were hoping to be able to go northward, um, and we're planning to do that in 2021, um, assuming that those communities are open and welcoming visitors. Um, so we are hoping that we can make it up there this year since we couldn't last year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so there's sort of three phases that go into our field season. The first one is trip planning, and that's not only planning what region we're going to visit, what parks we're going to visit, where we're going to camp at night, but also looking into um, the biodiversity in the area before we go and visit it so we can be familiar and know what to be on the lookout for. Um, so we'll look at sometimes the BC Parks website um, to find out what species we're likely to find. Also look into are there rare or invasive species that we should be aware of and kind of focus our efforts to be able to locate those species. Um, an example of this is on the Honeymoon Bay Ecological Reserve website. Um, you'll see that they wrote um, the ecological reserve was established to preserve the pink fawn on the ground for other taxa if we really want to find um, the presence of that rare species. Um, also, we may want to be on the lookout for invasive species. Um, so these two species observations of Jane tunicate and Japanese wireweed um, were taken to the island, just told us to be on the lookout for these invasive species, and then we were able to go out and find them in the field. So we really appreciate having this local knowledge to be able to focus our surveys. Um, and so if we are able to get in touch with any of um, the wardens or board members or someone who could maybe point us in the direction of some extra information when we're going to survey these ecological reserves, we would really appreciate it. Oh, I see from Jenny, my voice is breaking up. I saw my, uh, my internet said it's unstable, so hopefully 
it's uh, going to work okay as I get through this. <laughs> uh, next, thanks, Brian. Um, so the second phase is after we've done the planning, we go out into the field. Um, what we'll do in an area is to survey it using both a macro lens to survey insects and get the fine details of plants and a telephoto lens so we can survey birds mammals or anything um, that we don't want to get too close to. <laughs> and if you don't have a macro lens, I'm sure as a lot of you already know, there's a great trick of just using a hand lens and holding it up to your smartphone camera and that comes as as possible. So, this will mean that, um, you know, we'll try to survey on an elevation gradient if possible, or we'll spend some of our time surveying near parking lots or in between campsites looking for those invasive or introduced species that may have rolled in um, with vehicles. And then we'll also spend time in the more remote areas of parks um, looking for species that would occur in kind of undisturbed or less disturbed habitats. And finally, the bio blitzing does not end after dark. Um, as you can see here in the bottom left, that is Thomas and Lena in front of our moth surveying setup. What that is, is just a white sheet and a UV light. Um, turn on the UV light in the dark and moths will become attracted to the sheet. We're able to photograph them right there up against that white background. And then when we're finished, we turn off the light, uh, shake out the sheet. And so this is a great way to survey moths without having to get them stuck in a trap. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, finally, after we're finished in the field, um, you have to upload the data. So this involves sorting photos, cropping them, geotagging them, and just getting them ready to be uploaded to iNaturalist. If we're uploading observations that we're unfamiliar with, We'll use guidebooks or online resources to try to determine um, the identity of the species. Um, you'll see in the bottom left here, I just snipped in um, this little subsection of iNaturalist. When you click on the information on a species, you'll see similar species, which are um, commonly misidentified um, as the species that you're investigating. And so this can be another way to help you narrow it down. Of course, if you're not confident on your ID, you can always leave the identification at the genus family or a higher level. And um, somebody else will likely come in and set you on the right track. Finally, once you've done that, you put your observations on iNaturalist. So I just wanted to tell you about a couple of highlights um, from some ecological reserves that I got to visit this summer. Um, Haynes Lease Ecological Reserve in the Okanagan and Skahist Ecological Reserve um, near Lytton. You'll see it, it looks pretty smoky. We uh, visited Skahist in September, um, but we still found lots of cool species. So that was great. Uh, but I'll start with Haynes Lease. When we were there, we, um, found several endangered species, including lark sparrow and the brown spotted range grasshopper. And I found the brown spotted range grasshopper was an especially interesting find um, because as Brian mentioned, iNaturalist is great for tracking changes or maybe doing the opposite and tracking what is there year to year. And the 2019 iNaturalist team um, made several observations of this grasshopper. Um, and then we did again in 2020. So it was great to see that consistency from one year to the next. In Skahist Ecological Reserve, um, my coworker and I found this brown wasp mantid fly, which is one of the bizarrest creatures I have ever seen. <laughs> we were very excited to find it. Um, because I didn't know this species existed, let alone existed in British Columbia. 
and I believe there have only been a few observations. Um, this here is a robber fly. And while we'd seen many of them over the summer, I hadn't actually seen any of them with their prey in hand. Um, here, there's a little leaf hopper. So that observation was um, pretty interesting to see as well. And finally, I'll share with you some of the team highlights. I know Brian's showed many highlights from the project and I have eight here, but there are hundreds if not thousands of highlights if you go look at the BC Parks INAP project. Um, I found a rugose stag beetle in Main Lake Provincial Park on Quadra Island. Lena um, photographed this pinto abalone in Reed Island Provincial Park, which is just off Quadra. Um, up here, the morning cloaks we found with a bunch of other insects on this tree. We think it had been hit by a car. It was right adjacent to a campground and the tree was exuding a uh, sap. And so it attracted a ton of insects and it was really interesting to see what insects would tolerate what other insects um, being present in the same feeding area. Uh, Jason took this amazing photo of a bald eagle feeding on a seal carcass at Cape Scott Provincial Park. Uh, Lena took this one of a mountain goat that kept a close eye on our camp site in Purcell Wilderness Conservancy. And I believe Brian showed this photo. Thomas takes amazing, amazing photos, um, like this one of a jumping spider in Flat Lake Provincial Park. Also, his photos uh, of oak tree in Mount Zulum Ecological Reserve and of tube slime. It's small looking for more as I see. Okay, great, Kate. Okay, I think you're you're breaking up a little bit there. I'm gonna take over. Can everybody hear me? Maybe just give me a head um, um, thumbs up or, or something. We're good. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. The other thing that we, we do uh, in, in these cases is that we do try and get out in the field with folks. I see Colin has asked if we've worked with any of the ER wardens on our visit. We haven't, although we've worked with other, with BC Park staff. And Diane, that's a wonderful uh, um, offer. We will definitely take you up on that, COVID permitting this spring. We would love to come out to San Juan Estuary. The other thing that we've done to get people out into the field is we've had a, a little bit of money set aside uh, for what we call the supernats or the supernaturalists, uh, a handful of people who uh, um, are excellent uh, observers uh, who travel parts of the province, uh, places that we can't get to. Sid Cannings might come down from Whitehorse to get into Tachinchini. James and Kristen Miss Kelly were able to get to part of the Northeast. We had uh, um, Chloe and Trevor Van Loon, who live in Pemberton, were able to uh, do a lot of very um, isolated, protected areas. Uh, north of Pemberton, people like Jeremy Gatton and uh, um, Shane Johnson here on the island has got to do some great things. So these really contribute to finding lots and lots of species and getting into some places that we can't. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be able to pay for some gas and food and stuff for folks like this. In terms of some results to date from what we've found, uh, we've been working with a number of different scientists, including uh, Dr. Pat Hanley at Michigan State uh, University to go through our data and show you know, um, changes in before the project and after in terms of the number of species of plants, for example, that, uh, that have shown up, the massive numbers of insects, uh, fungi, which can be very difficult, of course, to identify from a, a photo uh, and so on. And the, and the ways that the data might be um, skewed, for example, there's a societal preference to big things. People like to take pictures of grizzly bears, but also for um, easy to photograph things like plants, uh, but it's really interesting, we've more than doubled all of the species known from BC Parks on INAT. And when I say we, I mean all of us, right? There are thousands wow. of people making these observations. We've more than doubled the known plant species to over 2,400 species. We're really trying to focus more on insects uh, with a lot of help from uh, like the Conservation Data Center. Uh, and then all arthropods, a lot of help from people like uh, Darren Copley will come up uh, in, a, in a minute. And there's more than 10 times as many observations now before the, the project started. 
we can drill down into these data as well to get at uh, where there are observations of uh, um, species with conservation status, they're endangered or threatened or what we might think of as red or yellow listed. Um, for example, in, in, in this example, uh, Garibaldi Park or uh, Manning Park, two places that are uh, day trips from uh, Vancouver. And where we can look a little bit more closely at the patterns of the ways that people make observations. So um, Manning Park has got a lot of observations. It's easy to get to, it's biodiverse. Uh, and we'll compare and contrast that with Soco South Okanagan Grasslands Protected Area, a very biodiverse, smaller area that's a little more uh, remote, a little harder to get to. And we can look at the so-called species accumulation curves. We can look to see how we're doing uh, with, uh, uh, as we increase the number of observations, are we, are we starting to hit some sort of asymptote in the number of species? And this is uh, across uh, all of Manning Park and then for some of our observers. Uh, and, and maybe we're starting to slow down, maybe a touch, but you can see that each time somebody goes, moves to a different part of the park, they're finding new, um, they're finding new um, species. Even someone like John Reynolds, who is closing in on 2000 observations, every time he goes to a different part of the park, he's finding something new. And the same with all our, our um, summer students who are doing a great job. It looks like Kate, in fact, is even finding more and more the more observations she makes. We see the same sorts of things in South Okanagan grasslands. Uh, we're simply not getting to the point where we're, we're running out of uh, things to observe, right? Uh, and this is just a subset of the observers. There are hundreds of other people going in. These are just the ones that we have the most information for. We can look too at how we're doing in terms of uh, covering off a whole bunch of different species. So there's about 3,500 different uh, um, native and non-native plant species in uh, British Columbia. Uh, and you can see that uh, the number sample continues to increase. Birds are always well sampled. There's about 320 breeding or sus suspected breeding bird species in BC. Uh, we're still not quite at uh, 300. Mammals uh, um, reaching an asymptote because difficult to observe ones like mountain beavers and uh, um, voles and moles and shrews and bats are underrepresented. Insects, uh, we just, every time we look, any of us look, we find more and more insects. We can go out with BC Parks, with our BC Parks partners, and they can provide us with um, lists of species that they haven't been able to go and survey for in decades and they want to know are still there. Things like uh, um, rare um, clovers, like this cup clover, uh, or they can say, uh, for example, we're thinking of expanding a parking lot or something. Can you go and have a look at uh, um, what uh, would be impacted in, in those sorts of circumstances? And we can provide these lists uh, of all of the species that are out there. This is for all of um, BC parks. You can see all of the protected areas. You can see there are a lot of um, species, uh, invasive species. There are a number of variously threatened species. Uh, um, these are by iNaturalist's um, definition of, of threatened species. So it includes some ones that are a little bit odd. Uh, but nevertheless, we can see what in invade or what uh, threatened species are out there and we're sampling them. We can also work with experts as Thomas does. He's uh, worked very closely with Darren and Claudia Copley uh, to um, collect a, a small number of, uh, of spiders, for example, where uh, you can get multiple photos, including of key diagnostic uh, images. We get great photos in the field, but we might also collect a specimen or two that uh, can be taken to the museum and, and real experts like, uh, like Darren can, can help with the IDs. So overall, we've gotten over 70 um, protected areas, over 1,000 observations, but over 625 um, protected areas around the province have uh, observations. That's out of 1,033 separate protected areas. So we're doing our best to get to a number of places. And the data, it turns out, are really, really useful. So this is Carmana Walbram, which is near and dear to many of our hearts, a really beautiful location you can see here from the, the banner photo. Uh, John Reynolds took his class here a couple of years ago and uh, um, they did some surveying as part of the class. I used to do this at the Hakai Institute before iNaturalist and we created a, um, a field guide and a website on what we found um, in the time before iNaturalist. But now you can upload it to iNaturalist and anyone can see it. So 
this was really useful um, for Kasilik. We were sitting down with the specialist subcommittee, the arthropod specialist subcommittee, and one of our candidate species was this, uh, this millipede, Jabafi levii, um, that uh, we could quickly go on to iNaturalist and we could see that John had made some uh, observations of it. Turned out that John, who's the chair of um, Kasilik nationally, was in the meeting, sitting in on the meeting. And so we just turned to him and said, are they common? He said, yeah, they're everywhere. So you don't have to worry about them. So we were able to get them off the candidate uh, species list really quickly. We can also, also go out and do targeted surveys as uh, Jeremy Gatton and Jenny Heron and John Reynolds and I did uh, for things like uh, um, endangered species that we're assessing right now with Kasivik, like this grapple tail butter or uh, dragonfly that's found at just a handful of sites in the lower mainland. And in fact, uh, um, Cameron Eckert went to, as well with John later on, but we were able to find uh, a new site for this species uh, during these surveys using iNaturalist and immediately um, upload these. And this has been really interesting because elsewhere people have found or made really interesting discoveries using the, the power of these citizen science um, framework. So in this case, the first record of painted, head, painted hand mud bug in Canada um, by someone from the conservation or from their natural um, heritage inventory um, group, which is the conservation data center in Ontario, Colin Jones, uh, found and photographed a crayfish at the Ojibwe Prairie in, in Windsor and uploaded it to iNaturalist thinking that it was uh, um, a regular crayfish that would be seen, the devil crayfish. And sorry, these are inactive taxons, but the, um, it just means that they've changed the uh, taxonomy a little bit. But this, this is the um, discussion that ensued Somebody pointed out that uh, um, there were ID characteristics on this that, that meant that it wasn't the devil crayfish, but in, in fact, it was the painted hand mud bug, which you know, Colin, who's an expert and looks for these things all the time, immediately recognized as a new species for Ontario and Canada. This is the real power of, of this uh, secondary research grade or community engagement with observations because you have experts um, like uh, Maya Glan here, who is a PhD student in um, crayfish systematics, who was able to uh, ID this, and they wrote the paper on this, and pointed out um, the importance of collaborative platforms for having that discussion on photographic ob uh, observations, where people can weigh in and point out um, uh, that it might be a species different than what you thought. We have local examples of this. This is Toxinevera. Um, uh, an invasive uh, fly species or a, or a non-native fly species that was identified on Bug Guide and iNaturalist by, um, by experts like Rob Cannings, uh, who you know, is always on my shoulder uh, as, a, as a guardian angel every time I'm taking a picture of a, um, a robber fly. I'm imagining Rob looking at my observations and I'm trying to get a great photo and Joel Gibson from the museum and Joel's on my other shoulder every time I'm down at the beach taking a photo of a fly to upload to iNaturalist. Every time I think this, is, this photo will not be good enough for Joel and I feel terrible about it, but I try and get better and better all the time. And of course we can, um, we can look at these in a whole bunch of different ways. We can make projects with rarities. We can have projects that engage people like uh, um, this one that Colin Jones set up for people to, uh, to kind of compete against one another to see the most species within five miles of their home. The wonderful coleopterist from Up Island, Scott Gilmore, um, uh, has got lots of species and so do Dave and Leah Ramsey um, here on the peninsula. And there are more general ones for the entire country like the Canadian Wildlife Federation uh, and uh, organizations like the BC Parks Foundation get engaged in this in, in this year we're able to uh, um, help people get to a million observations of, uh, uh, across all different platforms of community science. But iNaturalist is growing um, very, very quickly. There were about 200,000 observations when we first started this project in, in 2019 to over a million now. So it's growing rapidly. These are new, um, new pieces of data, new information on biodiversity across the province. We're getting reasonable um, 
Uh, we're getting reasonable coverage across protected areas. You can see some remote parts of BC that are hard to get to or are getting filled in, but uh, they remain remote. There are biases in the data. 85% of all of the observations are within 250 meters of a road. There are a lot of roads in BC, so most of the observations are there. I think I'll just skip these next uh, two slides. Um, but we're making as well observations. Uh, our team and other folks uh, all around BC are finding species that, uh, for example, you might not find uh, in eFlora, the gold standard, uh, I've always thought anyhow, of, of looking to see the sorts of things that you might find in BC. New observations um, turning up like this uh, Aphalon, observations of rare species like this uh, listed endangered nine spotted lady beetle. And then it turns out that um, for BC Parks, one of the really great things that they like about this is the access to having really great photos of biodiversity in their parks. They just simply haven't got this. And, and so um, if you choose a Creative Commons license, as all of us have done, that allows people to use your photos um, with attribution, then, then BC Parks is in a position to use these photos. I'm going to wrap up here uh, as we're running short on time with some plans for 2021. We're going to hire two teams this year of three and, and as Kate pointed out, do lots of pre-planning. We're going to work uh, and we're continuing to work with the Conservation Data Center and other experts and we'd love your ideas for prioritizing locations and species to target. This year, we're going to focus more on undersampled and rare species, so the little creepy crawlies and so on. We'll collect uh, specimens for museums when we feel like uh, we're seeing something new or we've got some indication from uh, the museum that we should be collecting things, for example. We have a permit to collect a small number of samples. We tend to not, uh, I think we've collected something like, uh, well, personally, I've not collected a single sample in the two years that we've been doing this. We're also, we have a, a graduate student, Ellen Gertz, whose data I showed earlier, who's going to focus on doing experiments in, in the ways that people um, observe to get better estimates of encounter rates and absences so that we can create models uh, of abundance and trends for species across BC. And we're going to extend the field season to earlier in April to catch many of those uh, um, winter annuals that, uh, that we see here on the coast, for example, at the very end of the flowering. Um, through to the end of September to do a better job of um, um, collecting more um, late season insects and uh, hope, hopefully getting into the field lots with uh, CDC and other folks. And we would love to have any of you involved and I'm so happy to see all of these uh, offers in the chat to go out into the field with you. That's so wonderful um, and we will we'll take you up on those offers. We'd love to get into the field with you, whether you're an ER warden uh, or, or you're interested in, in, uh, in getting into some of these really beautiful and biodiverse places with us uh, to, to help um, discover more about BC biodiversity. So I'll just summarize uh, I, um, here. This is uh, John Reynolds' favorite observation of all time, his uh, great big camera lens that he uses to take many photos. He was able to take this picture of a morning cloak uh, with his phone, you know, while he was also trying to take a picture of it with uh, um, with his big camera. So you can do any, uh, you know, anything with uploading from camera photos or, or your phone. Citizen science and iNaturalist in particular because of its, its breadth is the biggest development in biodiversity data in a century. It's really remarkable because we're engaging a huge number of new observers and we're sampling the undersampled. Um, we're getting to places that are hard to get to. Uh, we're getting there more frequently and we're seeing taxa that are difficult to sample. And mostly this is done with a higher frequency and with a larger number of people than in the past. All of the work is great uh, um, in the past and, and none of this could, um, could happen without um, all of that having set up taxonomy and systematics, et cetera. Uh, but this extends it and lets more people um, do uh, contribute to biodiversity understanding. We can make new discoveries, we can estimate species abundance in space and time. And that secondary data collection that I mentioned is, is really, really um, uh, uh, a, a very untapped part of, uh, of this. So we can contribute to further coverage, engagement and beyond. And I see Dan Kells has put in the um, chat, I didn't see any underwater photos. 
Um, and that's partly because for BC parks, they, their jurisdiction doesn't go underwater in very many um, instances. That's federal jurisdiction, but there are huge numbers now of um, underwater photos. And there's a project called BC Marine that's put together to collect only underwater photos. And so you can go and you can look there um, to, to see those sorts of things. It's really great. So thank you very much. I, I wanna thank a bunch of people that we work with and here's a photo of us in the field, but uh, I know I've gone on a little bit longer, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was really fascinating. <clears throat> and every single one of our participants has stayed here. <laughs> So there are some questions coming up in the chat. We have been noticing wolf activity on the back river in Port Renfrew. And oh, okay. then so Diane, all right. We've been noticing wolf activity on the back river near the eco reserve on our property in Port Renfrew. We hear them and have tracks on the back river bed. Well, great. Even if you hear them, Diane, you can record using, so for example, the voice recorder on any phone and you can, you can upload sounds to iNaturalist as well. So even if you can't see the wolves, if you can hear them, uh, you can upload the observation through your computer uh, um, and people will ID that. Rick has asked, uh, I'd love to have a chat with you about the Greater Victoria Naturehood Initiative. Sure, we can, we can talk about that in the migratory bird sanctuaries. That'd be great if you'd shoot uh, me an email. Um, I'm gonna go to Jenny. Uh, here, but then if anyone wants to turn on their their video and ask a question, I'd be happy to do that. Um, you turn yours back on, Brian. I turned you off when Kate was talking. Oh yeah, well turn me right back on then if you want, uh, Rick. All I can do is request you. Oh, okay. I, I have a question, uh, Brian. Yeah, okay, Gary. And since I've been in the process of uh, uploading our taxonomy from race rocks into uh, to get the pictures on um lately I, I do notice that there's a real dearth of information about uh intertidal uh, macroalgaes which is odd because there are um, in the south part of the island there are 19 ecological reserves that have water frontage and it would be very useful to have these things documented uh, because of the potential of catastrophic chemical oil spills and whatnot in the future and we just don't know where these things are. I mean, there's, uh, it would be very useful to have more people out there in the intertidal zones <clears throat> and uh, checking both invertebrates and macroalgaes. Yeah, and we'd, we'd be pleased to do that. There are some awfully wonderful um, algae folks in BC uh, who do great work. Um, I think of Patrick Martone and uh, Katie Hind here, Bridget Clarkson, and so on. These really wonderful people who uh, do absolutely great work and have contributed as well. One of the great things that we can do with iNaturalist is that we can develop these uh, bio blitzes pretty quickly where a lot of people can contribute. And even if you don't know what you're looking at in the field, if, you're, if you do a little bit of research or you do your best to get good photos of the identifying characteristics, you can upload them and, and experts will look and help with the IDs as well. I have a question about marbled neural leads. It's Marion coming. And that I'm wondering what attracts them to Oak Bay where they're so rare and Oak Bay doesn't have many tall trees. Sure. Yeah, Marion, that's a great question. There are a lot of them this year. Um, there's even more ancient murelets this year than um, uh, than marbles. Uh, I'm sure Jacques could uh, could chime in on those sorts of things. I think this year it's that there's a particularly good um, or particularly large amount of herring uh, around Victoria, which is really nice to see. So um, I I paddle around Oak Bay and I saw over 300. Um, ancient murelets and about 100 marbled murelets Ooh. last week. And, and of course, they're just coming here in the winter and then they're, they're leaving and probably flying out to the, to the west side of the island or up to the central coast or up to Desolation Sound, et cetera, to nest um, in the summer. Mm. Thank you. I see a couple of other questions here. I hope Kate is taking good notes on uh, all of the different offers to visit ERs. 
I'm just going to go back to Jenny, who asked a question. Um, I'll read it out here, Jenny. Like in her gap analysis, issue three mentioned 70 times in the ER management planning documents was limited information. BC Parks planners identified as a significant issue the lack of baseline environmental data. Yes, yes, yeah. So, uh, yes, we need more work in INAT or more INAT work in ERs. Happily, we will. Um, we have plans to go to. Uh, um, to some on Salt Spring, COVID uh, permitting, a couple of others. I paddled out to um, uh, to Great Chain Islet. Um, as I'm interested in trying to set up some research there. That place is a botanical wasteland, <laughs> unfortunately, as I was talking with uh, um, some folks about earlier. Uh, I think it was Maryland. It's all invasive species, but then you can contrast that with Trial Island, which has got is the highest density of species at risk anywhere in Canada. Mm. So um, these are remarkable places that uh, we would love to contribute more um, to. Although I, I should acknowledge that they all have excellent, very deep survey work. Um, we know what's out there. Uh, in the past, it's nice to go back and, and resurvey to see if uh, things have changed, though. Um, Rod has asked, does iNaturalist provide capability to record habitat niche characteristics while observing the species? So Rod, you can, um, one of the things that I didn't show in Cam Eckert's uh, photo of the grapple tail is that Cam always takes excellent photos. He's a, a dragonfly expert. He takes excellent photos of the um, characteristics you need to ID the, the dragonfly. But he always makes sure to take a photo of the habitat. So if it's running water or if it's, uh, um, if it's pond, if there are trees nearby. And you can put notes into um, each observation. So you can say what you think is important. And then there are a number of characteristics in drop-down menus that if you want to annotate your observation further, you can do. There's a lot of information that you can put in there if you're if you're interested and you take the time. Um, Chris has asked, uh, um, how do we reach out to experts for a particular species ID? I noticed that some mammal tracks I upload or are left identified. Chris, I don't know if you've um, if you've tagged them as tracks. There are people who really uh, revel in their expertise in tracks. So if you tag them, sometimes. Uh, mentioned that they're not just an observation of the of the animal itself, but of the sign. Sometimes that that helps. Um, let's see. Liz has asked, do you expect the reduction in marine nutrients due to the CRD new sewage project to impact marine biodiversity <laughs> and or abundance? Well, uh, I think that's already occurred in a, in a way because they no longer just dump it right out of Clover Point. And so Clover Point is no longer the best place in BC to go winter duck birding. Uh, so it's changed for sure. And, and Liz, um, I wonder about that because many things can't be detected out where that pipe um, historically is dumped out. But I wonder about the, the cumulative effects of all of that and how that will change over, over time as, uh, um, as the uh, um, treatment facility comes on. I mean, those are interesting questions that we can, we can answer with historic, comparing to historical data and data that we collect, uh, whether through eBird or iNaturalist. There have already been some big changes um, over the last 50 years. Um, let's see, Colin, I presume you're working closely with the Federation of BC Naturalists. Yeah, the Whistler BioBlitz is fantastic. Um, and we, we haven't spoken with Bob Brett directly, but some of the people who participate in that, uh, folks like uh, Scott Gilmore are so wonderful. Um, we talk with all the time. And I've got one last question here from Jenny, <laughs> but if anyone wants to ask another, uh, please, uh, please ask. Do you have any comments on the value of ecological reserves as study sites and any comments on how FER can encourage more biodiversity in ecological research and monitoring in ERs? I've got two comments there, if, if that's OK. The first is that when, when I moved to BC and we, and we had all kinds of reasons why we couldn't go very far afield, a new kid and, and some illness and so on, that kept us uh, um, pretty tight to home for a little while. But yet we're very close to places like Trial Island and the Oak Bay Ecological Reserve, um, places on Salt Spring Island like Mount Maxwell. We just thought we couldn't go 
to ecological reserves, uh, that it was forbidden, right? Like these were places that you couldn't go to and, and Trial Island has a little bit of that vibe because, uh, it, well, for a variety of reasons, there's signs right there that say you can't go there. Um, and it's got such a high density of species at risk. It is, um, it's a remarkable place, it's incredible. But I understand that's not really um, the case if there is uh, the possibility of doing research or restoration in those places, both of which I'm interested in. Um, I'd like to do that. And in fact, I've started over the last three months paddling to, um, to Little Trial Island to follow the um, phenology of a couple of plant species in preparation for um, hoping to do a little bit of research, some things that I've talked to uh, uh, Matt Fairbarns, for example, about. Um, and so, uh, what I would say is that these are some of the best places in BC to actually be doing these repeatable um, surveys. So a Bioblitz every year or a survey every couple of years, they're relatively easy to do. They pick up um, things and uh, they're, very, um, they, they, they're very focused, often quite small. But the other thing is that they're, they're very, very important. They're often right at the range limits of, um, of uh, what makes up most of the species at risk in Canada, the so-called peripheral species that, are, that have much of their range in the States, but just barely get into Canada. Many of them have range edges in ecological reserves. And if you wanna see a change or pick up a change, you wanna look right at the edge of something. And so I, I can imagine monitoring in, in several very important ecological reserves in BC. Kem has asked, and Kem has been so great the last couple of weeks uh, um, talking me through some um, bryophyte stuff. So thanks, Kem. Uh, have INAC collection projects been set up for the 31 CRD parks? Not yet, they're in the works. Um, John Reynolds, who I see is on the call, has set them up uh, in partnership with uh, Vancouver Parks. Uh, on in the lower mainland and we'd like to do the same here for CRD parks. Um, yeah, and Marilyn's pointed out I will need a permit for BC parks for my research. Yes, Marilyn, I've gone through that uh, process and that's part of the reason why I, I actually haven't pursued all that much um, research in some especially southern BC parks because it does take a while. Um, Brian, can I just jump in and uh, make a comment here? It's yeah, Beth Ramey, yeah. and I, I really so much appreciate your presentation and the work that you and John Reynolds have done setting this up for BC Parks. Um, my husband and I have just uh, in the past few months uploaded uh, several hundred photos for Kakwa yeah, Provincial Park north of um, Mount Robson. and. What, what has just been so interesting, you mentioned in your presentation, the collaborative nature. So like the identifiers who have put um, comments in, it's just, and especially my, my husband has the insects, especially that's quite fascinating, you know, the identifications that come in. Just in the last month, I've had two, um, graduate students contact me because of um, research they're doing and they've noticed plant photos. So, you know, they're wanting a bit more information. One, one aspect that John helped me with, but you might um, just explain this a bit more because I did not understand when you, take, when you take your pictures that you can group your observations together. So, you know, I was taking two and three pictures of a plant from different angles, but did not understand. So I would put a little note down, like same plant, but different locations. So that might be, be good to highlight to people. Yeah, that's a great point. And thanks, uh, Bev. I noticed your observations, I think, starting to be uploaded. I think it was the summer before last. And I was blown away by the quality of your observations in this very remote spot. I thought that, you know, this is, this is, as John said, this is one of us. <laughs> you know, yeah. Now we're just going to do it for the Fraser River Island because we haven't yet started there. But yeah, on the on the putting your observations together. That. Yeah. So when, it, as I mentioned, I don't use my phone in the field because I'm often collecting many observations. So you might do the same thing. You might do a hundred um, observations of different things in a day, but you might take three 
you know, you might want to get different parts of the plant, or you've got uh, 10 different uh, um, observations of an insect to get all of the different um, characteristics. When you upload those to iNaturalist, you can select them all and, and combine them. So a two-stage process where you select them all as you're, as you're uploading them to iNaturalist and then combine them. Or you can do it like John does, which is you dra drag and drop. You just drag them all together. And so one observation can be, if you upload from your phone directly, it can be four photos put together, map it together into one observation. Or if you do it on your computer, it's pretty much unlimited. So sometimes there will be, some people will upload 25 photos from different angles to get all of the distinguishing characteristics and combine them together in one observation. So that you provide more information, like you said, for those really excellent uh, um, people who help with the IDs. Is there an INAT manual? That's a very interesting question because I just was sent one. Uh, this afternoon by uh, Kate, uh, who is developing one with uh, some of our partners, including the museum and so on. So it's specific to BC. Um, but if you go to the iNaturalist website, they actually have some really tremendous um, video resources and, and written resources that, that describe how to um, how to do general iNaturalist uh, things. People have, because people do this when they're very passionate about um, something, they've put together all kinds of different specific manuals. So if you want to know something about how to take really great photos of tiger beetles, there's, there is a manual to show you how to take the best tiger beetle photos. There are all kinds of examples of how to do it for plants and so on. Uh, once we finish our INAT manual, we'd be happy to share it with you. You could even put it on the Friends of Ecological Reserve website uh, if you wanted. We'll, we'll send it all around. Um, but for now, I would recommend going to the iNaturalist website. Going uh, When you're on the website, go to Help and go down, and there are a number of different how-to um, uh, organizations. Oh, and Bob's also pointed out a very important point. There's also a forum on iNaturalist on the website where you can ask questions. People are great. It's like uh, Facebook in 2008, back when things were good. You know, like uh, this is still this wonderful community and hopefully it will continue like that. Uh, Orange Blossom has asked, do the various national, international INAT organizations interact? They do. There's actually quite a lot of planning right now for this because more and more of these data are very important. As I pointed out, um, Kasiwik is using them, BC Parks is using these data. And, and with iNaturalist, they all get put into a, um, a thing called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, gbif.org, which is a database that collects biodiversity information. And gbif uh, then will serve up that data to anyone who wants it. There were some issues early on around those uh, boxes that I told you about, about obscured or private locations where people didn't want to or didn't share the location that organizations at national and international levels were working together to make sure that, that managers would be able to get those data. Um, and uh, uh, so iNaturalist.org, the American um, body, has a, has a big um, organization at the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic, both in San Francisco and Washington. But also um, each um, national group like iNaturalist.ca um, has uh, a national group that talks um, about Can Canadian specific issues. John could fill you in on more of that because he speaks with them quite often in his role as a Kasiwik person. Brian, you had uh, a point that you mentioned about access to ecological reserves. I'm just going to uh, share this screen here to show you that. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Uh, yep. Can you see the? Uh, yes, we do. On the drop down menu under eco reserves, um, under ERs by name, you'll find out that 
it says at the top, ecological reserves of BC as of February 2013, note ecological reserve numbers marked with a, a star or a double star are closed to the public due to the sense of nature of the areas. And so you can just go down this list and you see here's one Anne Valley is yeah. closed, Bayer of Rocks, uh, Balangal and so forth. So that does sh I'll show you which ones are open. All these are, are open for access. Um, so you shouldn't have to worry about getting a permit to access to all of them, but uh, because there are some of those that are, are available, okay? Yeah, thanks, that's very useful, Gary. I noticed on that list you had uh, Blue River Dease Lake Ecological Reserve, which is a little ecological reserve in Northern BC that as uh, we were coming back from the Yukon Wildlands right. last year, um, off of Highway 37, we noticed one day on a map that there was this little teeny um, ecological reserve about 15 kilometers off on a dirt road on a logging road right. that we eventually found. And of course, because it was northern BC and it looked very small on the map, it was actually enormous when we got to it, but not marked in any way. Um, but we found it and, and uh, did a, a quick little bio blitz there uh, on our way by. All right. It's great. I, it's just wonderful to be able to go and, you know, pop off, uh, um, pop off the highway um, into these remote places, and you find uh, these wonderful things in these in these parks and reserves. I'm just uh, seeing this one on uh, various. There's that many of those those northern reserves that are very infrequently visited, and if anybody's near those areas, it would be great if we could get them in and get some shots of, of that and some of the added to. Yeah, that, that other one, um, Chicken Neck, right next to the road, uh, which is um, right by the number 37 on the, yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, another, there's a little tiny sign, you know, it says ecological reserve boundary that we went by at 100 kilometers an hour. And I said, hey, I think that was an ER sign. And we hopped out and we I netted Chicken Neck. Um, <laughs> It was fun. And, and these are all reserves also that really need wardens. If anybody likes traveling to those areas, uh, it'd be great to have a visit once a year um, to get some, some information about those. Okay. So there was a question for Reiki that uh, she did some training earlier. Will she be doing it again this year? She's still here. She was a moment ago. Yeah, Rika. Her name Rika, is Rika. right, sorry. <laughs> I'm Hi, having everyone. a hard time with names. <laughs> no worries. Just trying to unmute. <laughs> Where's the unmute button? Um, yes, definitely. So we did the uh, the training last year and would be happy to to do one again. Absolutely. And this might be a chance for me to mention that Gary has recorded this session and we'll be putting it on our website, I assume. Yeah, it'll appear. If you, if you want to find out the recent things that are added to the website, just always go over to that, the right hand side on the drop down menus, and you'll see uh, it says uh, something about uh, news and reports and uh, recently added things there. Uh, news reports, and then all posts from recent to past. So the most recent posts are always up at the top of the list there, and uh, and it'll be there uh, uh, probably by tomorrow <laughs> or midnight. <laughs> Do get in touch, folks. Uh, I'm very easy to find. There aren't very many Starzomskis uh, around. There are even fewer of them in British Columbia. So you can find my website and my email address very, very easily. Um, get in touch if you have ideas of places to go you'd like to get together in the field. Um, we're going to have a, a team, hopefully, that will be able to travel around for, you know, COVID, um, COVID uh, taken into account um, will be very safe. But we would like to get into the field with folks uh, happy to, to help um, with any iNaturalist things that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. We're approaching nine o'clock. That was an excellent presentation. And in a different time, I would give you a nice party gift. But all we can do is applaud and say thank you. I think we learned a lot. 
And I just noticed <clears throat> that I don't have a single iNaturalist observation in the BC park, and I have to fix that. And I hope everybody else here will do that too. That would be great. Even if uh, you know you have old photos that you um, that you can upload that that aren't already part of um, you know some database somewhere, they haven't gone to a museum, they haven't been eBirded. Uh, if, if they're already somewhere else, that I mean, that's great. I don't care if it goes on iNaturalist or if it's eBird or if it's in the museum. I, I just want the data, and I'd love to see you know older things. And we'll help with this if you're interested. I'd love to see older observations that haven't yet been turned into data, turned into data. Well, Mike Finger and I worked out at Deuce Lake in 1980, so I've got a box of slides here somewhere <laughs> that I've been meaning to go through for years now. Cool. Great. Well, thank you very much, folks. That was, that was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Any board members have anything else to say before we go? I'd just add that the videos that you talked about that Bristol had, uh, one on Vladimir Krajina and the forests and the other on Triangle Island, these are vintage uh, National Film Board videos. They're now in being processed um, at Island Video in town. And I'll have those on the website, uh, hopefully within the next, uh, they say about eight or 10 days. So check back. I, and, I'd like to... Sorry, and Gary uh, already has the other the other video, uh, keeping the options open. It's already on the uh, the Friends website, and it's really worth a visit or to to take a look at. So I'd just like to thank everybody for being here. I see so many faces that I haven't seen for years, and none this year, of course. So, so it's the best we could do. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I got one question for. Um, if I became an ecological warden, would I have, I know there's also ecological wardens for trial islands and right now, but could I like become a junior or apprentice warden and visit the islands more often? Like Jacques, could I, could I paddle over to trial island more often? Uh, John, you, if you're interested to become a warden, just uh, let's talk to We'll contact BC Parks. Okay. We just lost one, so your timing is perfect. <laughs> That's excellent. All right, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I would just, I, I, I would like to say something in a, a, this really, in the words of Chief Dan George in the movie, my heart soars like an eagle. This is, has opened up the possibilities instead of uh, griping a little bit at government, we can look in the mirror and get out there and add to, add to the record. And so thank you so much for the technology and the leaders. That, and, and this is truly inspirational. Thank you so much. Great. I just wanted to add, uh, this, is or question. this is orange blossom, by the way. That thought of Chief Dan George reminds me of hearing lots of stories from my native friends and it would be lovely if they could be encouraged to share their stories and their own names for animals and, and um, other, well, various species that they've related to over thousands of years. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Now you mentioned that, Marianne, we are looking at getting more Aboriginal involvement in, uh, in, in the Friends. I love so, that recent article about it, and thank you so much. So Orange Blossom, you, you had a question? Oh, I just wanted to make a comment that there's um, actually not a limit necessarily to the number of ER wardens you can have for a specific ER. Right. You just have to twist BC Parks' arm hard enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good to know. And, and actually, we would really like to encourage more younger people to come on as uh, assistants or helpers uh, and uh, eventually full-time wardens as well. And you don't have to be invited by BC Parks to begin with. You just contact the warden and uh, um, go along sometime and get involved and then let BC Parks know that you're interested. Um, exactly, we need young people badly. Yeah. I have. We're all gray now. I can get more young people involved. And John, um, just
just so you're aware, there's uh, there were three ER wardens for um, Trial Island. Um, I believe one of them is um, leaving that area, um, and uh, so more more wardens for that area is better because it's more eyes on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thanks guys, this has been awesome. I gotta go. <laughs> I think maybe we all should. <laughs> Nine o'clock on the dot. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Brian and Kate, you really opened my eyes. Nice seeing you all. Thanks folks. Good night great. everybody. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night, John boy. Good night. <laughs> Oh. Thanks very much, Rick. Good job. Okay. I yeah, managed. Good, good <laughs> job, Gary and Marilyn and Rick. Yeah, it all worked. Oh. We can do this much better next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a few tense moments there. <laughs> anyway, I think it went went really well and everybody stayed pretty good up to, you know, because as I was um, 